Okay, Maraba. It's, <laughs> it's great to see you all. Thank you ever so much for inviting me. It's a wonderful conference. Um, I chose the title Leading to Reading, and you might think this is a strange title for a conference on storytelling, which is historically one of the great oral traditions. It's been passed through generations, mouth to ear, mouth to ear to ear through the centuries, with bits added and bits taken away and settings changed. But in this generation, we have printed material. And in many of those other generations, they didn't. And there are just a few English teachers in the audience, I think, who are teaching children not just to speak, but to read English. And although we're in danger of losing it, there is a huge amount to be gained from encouraging children to read for pleasure, what in the US is often called free voluntary reading. The storyteller Andrew Wright at your conference two years ago quoted the American writer Stephen Krashen, and who said this, free voluntary reading is the most powerful tool we have in language education, first and second. A long time ago, before the invention of writing or even sign language, there was a prince. And the prince was put under a curse by a wicked witch. He hadn't done anything wrong, but hey, you know, witches, they live alone in the woods, they get evil, they get bitter. You know, they live in a house on one leg, it's bound to wobble. You know, they, they live in a gingerbread house. It's got to leak, hasn't it, you know? Give them, give them a break. Cut them some slack. But whatever it was, the curse was that he could only say one word each year. Wow. And for a storyteller, double wow. Now, he could save them up. You know, if he waited for two years, he could say two words and so on and so forth. But then he met a beautiful princess, and he fell in love with her body and soul. And he wanted to tell her. So he, with superhuman effort, he decided not to speak for two whole years, so that he could take her hand and look in her eyes and say, my darling. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but then, over those two years, he decided he loved her more and more, and he wanted to tell her that he loved her. So he endured three more years without saying a peep. That brought the number of dumb years to five. But after that time, he thought, no, he really had to ask her to marry him. So he bit his lip and waited for one, two, three, four more years, when the nine years of wordlessness were finally ended, he took the beautiful princess to a most private and romantic spot in the royal garden. He heaped a hundred red roses in her lap. He took her hand, he looked into her eyes, and he croaked out, my darling, I love you. Will you marry me? And the princess tidied a strand of her hair behind the most perfect of ears, opened her blue eyes wide, parted her lips, and said, Pardon? <laughs> hey, if you want longer stories, you've got to invite them for 22 minutes. <laughs> One reason stories are powerful tools is because many of them are entertaining and memorable. Did I have your attention then? Yes, I think I did. And as any speaker knows, stories along with humor, anecdotes, and such, you know, they keep an audience's interest and allow you to slide in some learning points. The audience will stay with you because they are waiting for that next time when you will entertain them. And that story approach works in school, and it works throughout the curriculum. Storytelling leads to all sorts of things, and you'll have heard already some of those things, and you'll hear more the rest of today. Storytelling leads to art. 
It leads to retelling in different words. It leads to original writing. It leads to thinking about the story, you know? Do you think she was right? What would you have done? And I think stories sometimes benefit from what I call pause points, where you just wait a moment and see what the students think, you know? The Lion King. He loved praise. He surrounded himself with advisors that would give him nothing but praise. One day, the Lion King noticed the people were backing away from him as he approached. Oh, he thought, <laughs> I wonder if I have bad breath. So he called one of his advisors to him. He called the jackal. He said, jackal, dear jackal, <laughs> tell me, he said, do I, by any chance, <laughs> have bad breath? And the jackal spoke, forgetting, and he spoke the truth. And he said, oh, your majesty, oh, yes, it's very bad breath today, oh, dear. <laughs> stinky, 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 oh, it's like bad socks. <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> said the Lion King, and with one blow of his paw, he put an end to the jackal. Fox, he said, tell me, is my breath foul or fresh today? Now, the fox had seen what had happened to the jackal. Oh, no, your majesty, no, 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 your, your breath is as fresh as a field of flowers. It was obvious that the fox was trying to flatter the king. Ah, said the Lion King, I cannot stand a liar. And with another blow of his hand, he put away with the fox. Rabbit, rabbit, come here. I need a trusted advisor. Now tell me, is my breath fresh or foul? Now the rabbit had seen what had happened to the jackal. The rabbit had seen what had happened to the fox. He was trembling. You know, stories do that, don't they? They hold your attention. And maybe there are pause points like that when I give you opportunity to think what you would do. It would be cruel to move on, wouldn't it, really? The rabbit said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, I'm, I'm very bad cold today. He said, I, I really couldn't judge. <laughs> anyway, to continue, stories also lead to reflection. Perhaps I should be kinder in future. Maybe I could be bolder. They lead to drama. They lead to learning, which is why, you know, storytelling is great for language learning, because storytellers use informal language, not flowery, literary language. We use idiom, colloquialisms, you know, cut her some slack, give her a break, yeah? We use slang, proverbs, sayings. And we use those three R's of rhyme, rhythm, and repetition, which make that story so memorable. They lead to better speaking. They lead to self-confidence. They lead to motor skills. Look at all my gestures, hopefully trying to explain some of those English words. It leads to understanding. You can't fight someone when you know their story. Um, but what isn't in that list so far is reading. Storytellers come in all shapes and sizes, and they come from all kinds of backgrounds. Some from teaching, some from acting, some from stand-up comedy, some just because they have discovered a gift, sometimes just because they're alive, because all of us are storytellers. Um, and I was reminded of this recently, but teachers in the audience may know, you may have had um, letters from parents maybe explaining their child's absence in your class. I came across some of these. These are actual excuses received by schools from parents. Sorry Victor could not attend school yesterday as there was no sugar for his breakfast cup of tea. <laughs> I think it's rather sad, don't you? Um, Emily was not in school yesterday because my brain was disengaged. I thought it was half term. <laughs> or um, Kevin was absent yesterday as I took him to the zoo to see his cousins. Donald has been away with his head. He's had it on and off all week. Or indeed, Colin came home yesterday with a hole in his trousers. Would you please ask the headmaster to look into it? 
And, um, you know, so we, we all do that storytelling. Um, we're different, though, storytellers, because of our characters coming out, because of the stories we choose. My background, like several of the great American storytellers, although I'm not comparing, is library work. When I had a proper job, I used to work in children's libraries for about 120 years. Um, I was reminded the other day I was having my hair cut and I was telling the woman what I did. And I said, I tell stories. And she cut for a few more minutes and she said, it's not a proper job though, is it? Um, it also reminds me of the, um, the story from Konya here in Turkey of the old man who was going to marry a young woman and he went to the barber and he said, can you, can you cut off just the white hairs? And the barber thought for a minute and looked at his watch. He said, well, I'm very busy. I have to go out. He cut off all the man's hair, put it in front of him and said, look, can you sort out the white hairs while I go? Um, but in those years, I've seen a lot of brilliant children's books. And so wanting to get children reading for pleasure is natural to me. Uh, we find stories in many places. But some of the key ways we find stories are hearing them from others and reading them in books. And there's the first leading to reading point. Storytellers read. You heard one of our guests today say that she took a book with her. Um, when I visit other countries, I try to pick up stories I can bring back. And stories provide encouragement to children who are learning to read. I once heard a primary school girl exclaim in exasperation, how am I ever going to read if all the words are different? And I was watching a young boy struggling in class with his reading book. It was obviously very hard for him, but he was persisting. And I said to him, why, why are you trying so hard? And he said, so I can stop. So they need stories all the time to keep them going. Never read a picture book to 500 people. Here's a lesson for you. This is called Wait, I Want to Tell You a Story. You don't particularly need the pictures. Once there was a muskrat sitting quietly in a tree. I had to look up what a muskrat is. It's a little furry animal. It's got big ears. That's why I like it. Along came a tiger. What is the tiger going to do with the muskrat? Eat it. Why? Because he's a tiger? Because he's hungry? How do you know he's hungry? Thank you, madam. I say this because children will usually spot this first. He is wearing a bib, as you say, a napkin. And adults will take a long time to see that. Children are visually very acute. They're growing up in a world, aren't they, full of DVDs, uh, posters, magazines, internet. I'm going to eat you, little muskrat, said the tiger. Wait, said the muskrat. I want to tell you a story. OK, said the tiger, but make it quick. Once upon a time, said the muskrat, there was a frog sitting by a pond, and a big shark came up through the water and said, I'm going to eat you, little frog. Wait, said the frog. I want to tell you a story. OK, said the shark, but make it quick. Once upon a time, said the frog, there was a lizard sitting on a rock, and a big snake came along and said, I'm going to eat you, little lizard. Wait, said lizard. Sorry, all my small animals have got the same voice. <laughs> I want to tell you a story. OK, said the snake, but make it quick. Once upon a time, said lizard, there was a fly sitting on a web, and a big spider came up and said, I'm going to eat you, little fly. <laughs> Wait, said the fly, I want to tell you a story. <laughs> I don't want to hear it, said the spider. And the spider ate the fly. <laughs> I, I'm glad you're laughing. You know, because some, I, I've done this sometimes, and teachers are going, oh. Because <laughs> they're sensitive souls at heart, aren't they, really? <laughs> and I, said the tiger, just testing the echo. <laughs> and I, said the tiger, I'm going to eat you, little muskrat. Wait, shouted the muskrat. There's more. <laughs> you see, the lizard ate the spider, and then the snake ate the lizard, the frog ate the snake, and then the shark ate the frog. What happened then, said the tiger, who's getting quite interested, isn't he? 
That's what stories do. They pull you in. He's forgotten he's hungry. What happened then, said the tiger? And then the crocodile ate the tiger, said the bus guard. What, what crocodile, said the tiger. Ahem! And the muskrat got away. It's, um, it's like Scheherazade with animals. It's useful, isn't it, to be able to tell stories. Storytelling leads to children reading for themselves. If you tell children or show them where the stories came from, and that includes using picture books too. I know that some storytellers regard this as a little below telling stories. They sometimes call it story reading. Um, but your conference's definition of stories is, I think, quite rightly, a very wide one. There are some brilliant picture books out there, and they include traditional stories. That Joanna Troughton series of an Australian stories. Or you can still get Paul Galdon picture books from the States, sometimes stories in two languages. And those are a valuable, a valuable resource. You could also use those voice skills that storytelling teaches you or lets you practice with tasters of contemporary fiction. And this is something that I sometimes do when I visit schools. Because when you hold up a book, that book gains a sort of halo. Oh, I never knew that book was there. It might have been sitting in the library like this with its spine out. Helps if it's that way. Helps even more if you read a taste of it. This is a horrible old man called Mr. Gum. Prepare yourselves. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Gum was a fierce old man with a red beard and two bloodshot eyes that stared out at you like an octopus curled up in a bad cave. He was a complete horror who hated children, animals, fun, and called on the cob. <laughs> what he liked was snoozing in bed all day, being lonely, and scowling at things. He slept and scowled and picked his nose and ate it. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I do apologize. I don't know how that got in. Come on, we've all done it. You know, if you, if you just read a taster, children will then want to read that story. And don't forget poetry too. I use poetry, and I'm short for time here, I use poetry, and I think a lot of storytellers will use poetry between stories as a natural break, as a change of pace, as time for you to think which story you're going to read next. This is a story, a poem for maybe older children. It's about a hotel which is run by snakes. And you'll hear words like anaconda, boa, viper, uh, and python. But those voice skills can help you lift that poem off the page. An Indian python will welcome you to the snake hotel. As he finds your keys, he'll maybe inquire if you're feeling well. And he'll say that he hopes you survive the night. <laughs> that you sleep without screaming and don't die of fright at the snake hotel. There's an anaconda that likes to wander the corridors at night, and a boa that will lower itself onto guests as you search for the light. And if, by chance, you lie awake and something nearby hisses, I warn you now, you're about to be covered with tiny, vipery kisses at the Snake Hotel. And should you hear a chorus of groans coming from the room next door, or the python cracking someone's bones, please don't go out and explore. Just ignore all the screams and the strangled yells when you spend a weekend at the Snake Hotel. So poetry too, you know, you can bring alive. And riddles, riddles are a great way also getting children to then look up books of riddles themselves. I sometimes work with high school children, and if I say to them, a man was approaching a field with a pack on his back. When he got to the field, he knew that he would die. How did he know? And some of the answers that come back are brilliant, and any one of them could be the start of another story. Was it a pack of wolves on his back? Could be. You know, was the field a minefield? And because they see it on the news, you know, was he a suicide bomb? All these things come out when you discuss them. He was approaching it that way, by the way. 
The pack was his parachute. It wouldn't open. So he knew that when he got to that field, strawberry jam. Um, so riddles are another source that leads to readings. Um, you need pathways. If you like that one, try that one. So that you, and you can do that with traditional stories too, can't you? Put stories together. Here's another story about a hare. Or can we think of any other stories about bears? That's useful stuff to do. Um, kids need to be able to access books. They need to be a lively library, you know? Or uh, nearby bookshops. Or parents who will give books for birthday presents and so on. You need to model reading yourself so that they realize you're a reader and someone who enjoys stories. My, um, my son, bless him, both his parents were librarians. He never stood a chance. You know, he was read to relentlessly from when he was still damp. Shutting him up was the problem. Tell me, teachers, I'm right, aren't I? You can tell a child who has been read to in their vocabulary, in their confidence. Finally, can I make a plea? Despite all that I reminded you about stories leading to things, please hold back sometimes on all those follow-up activities you might think about. We're going to hear a story, and then we're all going to write our own. You know, and sometimes children sit there with a little cloud over their heads. Um, just sometimes. Say to children, look, we've got ten minutes left. I'm going to read your story. You don't have to do anything afterwards. And watch them go, ah. And that next ten minutes is gold. Because maybe for the first time, you're showing them that stories are something that adults actually do because they like it, and that it's not part of that curriculum that they are forced to do. Here's the last bit of reading, um, and this comes full circle, because this time, and I'm common with a lot of storytellers, I'm sure, it's wonderful to get children's feedback. And so that reading includes, I think, sometimes reading letters from children. Here are just two or three to finish. Um, this is from a very high-class school, probably like your own here. Um, Little girl, I'm going to have to use my posh voice for this, all right? Dear M.R. Williams, not Mr., but M.R., dear M.R. Williams, thank you for the stories. I thought they were fabulous. You have a fabulous imagination. That was the best part of my day, she wrote. She finishes, thank you for coming to our school and wasting your time on us. Um, and for, this, is, um, this is from Stacy, and she said... Um, I'd like to say thank you for doing funny stories and poems. You deserve to go on television, anywhere but, anywhere but here. You are funnier than anyone could be, she says. She adds, if you have a wife, children, and grandchildren, thank you, Stacy. If you have a wife, children, and grandchildren, they must pee themselves laughing at you. <laughs> now, I'm taking that as a compliment, all right? I don't care what you, what you say. So all of that. I hope, might remind you of another aspect of storytelling. Take it up, run with it, get them listening, but get them reading too. Thank you.